All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back in session, and this is a work session called Results-Based Accountability for Racial Equity. I will turn this over to Commissioner Fritz. Uh, thank you, and I'll turn it over to Dr. <laughs> thank, thank you for that rousing speech. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah, I'm just nights. going to do a really um, brief introduction and kind of a setting the stage, and then we're going to let um, Eric and Theo get up here. So um, basically, quickly, what is RBA? I think it's important for you to just kind of have a highlight oh, of that. Oh, good, another acronym. Oh, I love <laughs> it. So results-based <laughs> accountability, RBA, um, is a methodology that starts with the desired results and works backwards towards the means to ensure your plans, um, or our plans, work toward community results with stakeholder-driven implementation. This disrupts historic patterns of doing what we've always done because we've always done it that way. The Office of Equity and Human Rights has been hosting an eight-month cohort training program on racial equity-centered results-based accountability for city directors, managers, and city leaders. This cohort started in February and ends in September of this year. Cohort participants are being trained with the results-driven methodology that moves good intentions or a head and heart understanding of structural and institutional racism to impactful action inside of and external to organizations and partnerships. By the end of the sessions, particip participants will become more confident using the RBA methodology to implement equity plans and serve as RBA change agents in their bureaus. Today, you'll get an introduction to this powerful work that's been happening. So very quickly, our facilitators are Erica Burnaby. Um, she is the founder of Equity and Results, LLC. She's a leader in the strategic design and implementation of whole organization and collaborative work to achieve equitable results in low-income communities and communities of color. Through Equity and Results, she works with small and large large nonprofit philanthropic and public organizations nationally and internationally to use a racial equity results driven process to build the capacity of leaders and communities. Erica uses an anti-racist lens developed by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond and results based accountability developed by Mark Friedman to look at how organizations and collaboratives can work differently to do systems change work and strategically disrupt business as usual. Erica's deep knowledge of community based participatory processes encourages accountability with formal, informal, and community leaders so that there is buy-in at all points in the work. And then Theo Miller has over 20 years of experience leading community and neighborhood development solutions to some of the world's most complex problems, an expert facilitator and educator on racial inequality and social change for equity and results. Theo has taught in university, criminal justice, corporate, and community environments around the world. Um, Theo is currently a senior advisor for the Office of Mayor London in Breed and the director of Hope San Francisco, the nation's first large-scale partnership aimed at transforming dilapidated and segregated public housing neighborhoods into vibrant, racially equitable, mixed-income communities without mass displacement of residents. Um, he is a graduate of Yale University and Harvard Law School, and he was inspired in college by the young residents of New Haven, where he worked as a community organizer and mental health counselor. Throughout his career, he has advised and led businesses, universities, hospitals, and elected officials in urban areas across the country to redesign policy, create new models of collaboration, and achieve dramatically better results for low-income communities of color. And then finally, my message to you. Um, is that the Office of Equity and Human Rights is excited that you have had some policy directors from the council that have been able to join the cohort to learn and practice the RBA methodology. We're also glad that some bureau directors are participating with their designated leaders, and we have some folks in the room behind me. We encourage the council offices that were unable to send representatives to contact our office so that we can share RBA and how to support it and them. And finally, I encourage you to lean in and explore the countless opportunities this methodology provides, acknowledging that the work of dismantl dismantling systems of oppression is messy and requires significant paradigm shifts, not only in our work, but in ourselves. So thank you for being open to engaging today and enjoy. Thank you. All right. As they're coming up, I just want to say that uh, both the fire, uh, the the fire bureau, fire and emer um, and I, who are these people that are my people? <laughs> <laughs> I just lost my train of thought. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say that the Fire Bill and the Bill of Emergency Management have both participated in this training, and they have raved about um, just how useful it was, uh, both at, uh, uh, in the training and then how they've been able to use it once they got back to the bureaus. And so I'm just excited. I know nothing except that they were excited. <laughs> so if they're excited, I'm excited. So welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Well, 
Thank you so much for having us today, Commissioners and Mayor. I'm going to be up there. Um, Is it on a PowerPoint? There is a PowerPoint, yes. But you have a copy of it. Would you like us to hold off for a second? We have handhelds. Test, test, test. Oh, yes, oh no. We're just I just meant for the PowerPoint. Did you want us to wait? Okay. You don't want to know where that goes. <laughs> you are bad. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon again, Commissioners and Mayor. Uh, we are so pleased to be with you, uh, par in part because... Yeah, we've right. got this right here. Oh, yeah, thank yeah, thank you so much for caring for us, though. Yeah. Um, because we are here after having worked with your departments for the past six months, and it's not even over yet, um, and due to the hard work of both Kofi and Markeisha and the team, including Yolanda and Grace, uh, we have uh, something that they dreamed up two and a half years ago when we first met is really coming to fruition. And at this point, Portland is ahead of the curve around the country when it comes to uh, having departments at such a scale begin to think about this work collectively, uh, especially when it comes to racial equity. And so we just, first of all, want to say thank you for having us, but also thank you to the people in this room uh, whose vision we are actually um, facilitating rather than leading. And so thank you. Yeah. Um, introduce us. Also, Sophia Miller, you have our bio. It is a privilege and an honor to be in front of you. I will say, just like Erica, worked with many mayors, many city councils, and it is unusual for a group as distinguished as you to take the time. We will be tight. We will be interactive. I am a lawyer by training, so this will be a dialogic conversation. We know it's a beautiful day outside, but we're going to try to get through a lot of material um, fairly quickly and really try to get feedback from you about what's happening here, here in Portland. Um, I would say from, from my experience, it's been an extraordinary privilege to work with your bureau directors who really are craving doing something different, doing focusing on racial equity in a different way. And so thank you so much for the time. We'll also just let you know that we won't be using every slide that you're looking at in front of you. It's for you to take afterwards because we're doing a much abbreviated version. Um, but we do want to make sure that we have a sense of a single question you might, might have as we go into this. So it's called results-based accountability for racial equity. And when you hear that, uh, is there a sentence or a thought or a question that comes to mind as we get going? Results-based accountability for racial equity. So. If you don't all have to answer, but if anyone has a thought that comes to mind, or oh, what the heck does that mean, or that kind of thing? I would just say measuring whether or not we're getting what we say we want. Mm -hmm. right? We spend a lot of time talking about equity, but we, don't, we, don't, we haven't actually um, operationalized it. Right? What does it That's look right. like when we've reached equity? Right? Thank you. Awesome. Anyone else just want to think a little through it, or does it, uh, do we want to hear a little bit more about what we're talking about before we ponder it? I'll hear a little bit more? Explanatory. Sounds self-explanatory. Good. Well, I'm glad. Um, it, it sounds like a mouthful to me often. So um, what we want to start out with is by the idea that, nope. this quote that we like to begin with is that you can't be neutral on a moving train. And it's a quote by Howard Zinn, who wrote the book, um, A People's History of the United States. And the idea behind this quote is this that oftentimes when it comes to racial equity work, we believe that we can sort of take racial equity on and off as if it's a lens that we can put on, but that most of our work can get done without this lens. But what we know is that in this country, um, and uh, how long has racial has racism existed in the United States? A couple years. Couple, couple years. How old is the United States? <laughs> yeah, so it might be hundreds. Um, if folks say five, six hundred years, if you think about even before racism began to be institutionalized, that um, these train tracks are deeply rooted inside of this country, inside of the state, in the city, everywhere. I mean, I live in New York. Theo lives in San Francisco. San Francisco. It's, we have the same inequities everywhere. But that if we believe that we can be neutral on some things, but then sometimes we actually can put a racial equity lens on, um, it actually is something we need to challenge. Because neutrality uh, is actually a choice from our perspective. And as we talk about impact, and we talk about what our departments do and the projects and initiatives our departments, it's almost as if we think that somehow uh, we can have an office that owns it, but that it's not sort of dispersed across. So our challenge is, as we talk with departments and also as we talk with you today, is to not think about it as a lens that we can take on and off like a pair of glasses, but rather a set of principles that inside of every single thing we do, we embed. And that's true for how we measure impact. It's true for the process by which we analyze whether things are working or not. And it's also true inside of every action we take. So we were just with Seattle yesterday, the Office of Budget and Mayor's Office. And the budget office keeps saying, well, how, how do we apply 
racial equity to budget. It's such a technical process. And we went through the whole day. And every single technical aspect, along with every content aspect, can have racial equity embedded into it. But we have to understand how. Often we care about things up here. Some of us have had personal experiences, uh, folks of color, uh, due to structural institutional racism. And so that experience exists. And many of us white folks also believe that we, we, we know racial equity is, is, is important to us. But how? How does it land in our hands? So this methodology helps us get there. What we would typically do at that point is to ask our colleagues to think about where the train tracks are headed. We won't do that with you. We got a sense from your budget conversation about homelessness, about the people in the streets, about people being displaced out. And so those tracks have deep, deep, deep roots. But that's important in whatever city we work in, whatever colleagues we work with, to get a sense of where you feel when you think about racial equity, racial inequity, where those tracks are headed. That's where we start. That's right. And we also want to make sure that we, we are clear from hearing about your budget, also from really looking at who you are as people, your past, how you got elected, the kinds of things you care about, that your intentions are incredible. But what we also know is that good intentions are not the same thing as impact. And so when we talk to department directors, or we talk to city council members, we talk to folks who have a lot of authority and power inside of our systems, we often say we're trying our best and we're doing our best. And we have no doubt about that, especially not here in Portland. But what I will say <laughs> is that well, what we hear from community is, yeah, 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 good intentions, but what is it, how does it land on the ground? And so what we focus on when it talks about racial equity is actually not the hearts and minds work. We know brilliant people in Portland, all over the Northwest and all over the country that will teach us what is structural and institutional racism. How does it play out for us? How does it work? How does a white person like me or a person of color, how do we interact on a personal level? But that's actually not what Theo and I do. We do structural work, and we talk about institutional work and the way that systems either do racist things or don't do racist things. Uh, we don't actually talk about the personal. So again, it's not about intentions. It's actually about impact. And if we start with impact and work backwards, we can tell if we're getting there or not. So our definition of racism that we use comes from the People's Institute. And there's a slide in there we're going to get to um, our iceberg in a second, is race prejudice plus power equals racism. And we just, very simple definition, again to Erica's point, not about the individual animus, we're not talking about good or bad people, but we're talking about that combination of prejudice with power that ends up impacting results systematically. And we're gonna fly through this fairly quickly because we know uh, Portland's done a lot of work on this, but we just wanted you to have a sense of how we define racism. And just a simple idea just to keep in your head is, of course, when we see folks um, who have um, you know, who are Nazis or somebody where you can visibly see um, an articulation of racism, of course we understand that as racism. But also, there are things that are happening inside of our own systems that produce racial disproportionality or racially disproportionate outcomes. And so that's where we're focused on with racism, the, the definition of racism. So I want you all to imagine the iceberg. I know you can see it on your page. Don't even worry about reading it. It's actually not a matter of being able to read it or not. But you can see there's a line and above the water is the obvious stuff, right? Above the water is stuff that's really about um, the language we use. We use, we use racial slurs. We, um, all the kinds of stuff that's obvious about racism. Like I said, if you had a Nazi rally in the street, it would be obvious to you. If. Right? When. If, when. That's right, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. That's right, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. When. When you have, that for us feels like that is what racism is. What we're here to say is inside of your systems that we've been working on for the past six months, we're actually focused below the line. Your department directors, all of their staff, are brilliant and well-intentioned and so committed that we're not talking about what's happening above the line. We're actually talking about what's happening below the line, which are the way the systems are structured, how those, those, those structures are held accountable or not, and who makes decisions. So we've been focused on the below the belt picture. Mm -hmm. So we, the next slide is about concentric circles. And I don't mean to suggest that the individual issues with racism are irrelevant. They're not. They are, they are relevant. And there are probably individuals within Portland, can you believe it, that have deep-seated racial animus. But where we operate in terms of RBA is at the system level, which is about institutional and structural racism. What happens at an institutional level would be those policies, those practices, that are within a given organization, that are within the mayor's office, or within a given commissioner's office, or within the Department of Transportation. How all those bundle together is how, what we define as structural racism. So this is how these effects interact. They accumulate across, across institutions. This little area of intersection is the interpersonal. 
So we totally support the office to continue to do this hearts and minds work, but where we will stay today is at the system level. At the system level that says, how can we actually get better outcomes from our institutions and from the structures that combine right. together? And that's, this is the space where we're going to stay in today. So it's not to say that the Nazi rally and the, the offensive stuff that you see is not important. But what you all have the power to do, and your, your bureau chiefs are really interested in, is thinking about how we can stack it together as institutional um, agencies for our entire system. So now we're going to get into a little closer to the methodology. Um, and you all remember this, those of you in the room. But we want to ask, when I say the word accountability, what comes to mind? So what words come to mind when I say accountability? What is it? It's been a long Throw day. them out there. That's okay. Um, um, just a couple of words. Benchmarks. Benchmarks. What else? Data. Data. Outcomes. Outcomes. Transparency. Awesome. Transparency. Oh, oh, yeah. Shut me up. <laughs> no, I want it. Please, please keep it going. Positive and negative stuff about accountability. Buzzword. Oh yeah, buzzword. What else, everybody? Uh, race neutral. Race neutral. Who do you feel accountable to? Why you do what you do? Myself okay. and to the community. Yourself Self and the community? And community? Herself and the community? Anybody else? I'm accountable to my colleagues as well. Colleagues? Family. Family? Awesome. Taxpayers. Taxpayers. Let's be real. Anybody else that you're accountable to? The future. Future. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. right? Absolutely next generations. And so here's the thing about accountability, and this is where we usually start. It's not an either or. We're not going to get rid of the things that we have to do that are required, and we're also not going to get, we don't want to get rid of the things about why we came to this work. Because I know this, you didn't come to this work to potentially uh, get to the buzzwords. You didn't come to this work to become accountable to benchmarks, per se, by themselves. You came to the work because you're accountable to the people of Portland uh, you came to the work because you're accountable to yourself, your own values and ethics, because of your family and the future. You didn't come here just to check the box. We know that. You would not be in the positions you're in. And yet we sometimes set our systems up as if accountability is just about doing what we need to do and compliance. So it's not to say we don't have compliance. It's to say that we need to be able to hold both. And if we hold both in a way that's powerful and is impact driven, we can actually still get done what we need to get done but do it in a way that does not negatively impact people of color. And the key for us is this. Um, again, in our accountability, if we're doing things that we, we deem neutral, but they actually have an uh, unintended impact. Or intended. Or intended impact on people of color, then we need to uh, identify a way to do that differently and simultaneously, not just do no harm, but actually positively impact communities of color. Because what we believe is, if communities of color benefit, everybody benefits. Yeah. That if we think that the rising tide is what's going to lift all boats, we've tried that. How long have we tried rising tide? We have a constitution. Okay, that constitution right. says, even with the, the amendments that have been made, even with those, we've not seen equity. And so again, while we do have uh, poor white folks, and we do have disabled community and queer community, I mean, look at this beautiful room. Um, of people and flags, um, that if we focus on folks of color in Portland, who, who the system has not served and underserved and intentionally sometimes, um, we know the history of Portland and land ownership, et cetera, that if we focus on folks of color, then everybody else will benefit, not just in their hearts and in their minds and in their spirit, but actually. And so again, we hold ourselves accountable to both. And as soon as we find ourselves going just towards compliance and that race neutrality, we come back. And so this methodology it is complex because it allows us to do both. And I would say as we transition to the methodology and the tools, we have been thoroughly impressed by your bureau directors who have, who have received this idea of centering race, frankly, in a community that has a small population relative for people of color. And so this has, been, this has been an idea of really putting race at the center to get to inequality broadly that your leaders have actually taken on. So we're going to now talk about the, the way we're going to do our work. So here's the thing. A lot of times, we'll take a hammer and we'll put it on the table and say, guess what? This hammer will now build a house. If I said that to you, commissioners, would you think that I, so what would you think? Here's a hammer. It's going to go build a house. 
say nice looking woman, but you're looking <laughs> <after> <laughs> this. What would you say, Commissioner? Good. Performance artist? <laughs> <laughs> I had some sci fi fans in your directors, and they were like, cool. And I was like, no, no, no. Yeah, screwdriver. That, that's right. Yeah. So we all know, commissioners, that this beautiful hammer cannot build a house. We also know that if, it, if we don't use it in the way it's intended to be used, what could we do in this room with this hammer? Harm. 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 Real harm. So tools are just as helpful as they are able, to, excuse me, tools are only as good as the principles and the skills and the individuals that use those tools. A lot of times we think we could just buy a tool and all of a sudden racial equity is going to happen or data is going to get good or the police department, we do this one, or, or any department, education, anybody, we do this one training and things will get better. But in fact, we actually need to have a set of principles through which we do it. So a lot of times with our impact work, we think it's just about the data. We can get some, some brilliant data analysts in Portland, and there are brilliant data analysts in Portland to go do some crunching numbers, and that's what data work looks like. But instead, we actually need a set of principles that everybody can use to focus on impact using racial equity. So we're gonna now quickly go through the set of principles, and then right after we do that, We'll finally show you the tool, and we hope, if you're not too exhausted, commissioners, that you'll play along with us a little bit so that we can see that this is not just for your departments, but actually has some implications for you all, potentially, if, you, if you're willing to join us in that conversation. So we have seven principles we like to talk about. Um, I'm going to go through them pretty quickly, but then Theo and I will play back and forth once we get back to the methodology. I'm the true born New Yorker, so I'm the one who gets to talk quickly. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm from Baltimore. I, so I read I that, you, Commissioner, yeah. so you feel it. Yeah. <laughs> and Theo lived a lot of time in, on the East Coast, so I always forget. I'm always like, did so, you grow up in Philly or Boston? No like where? So we have seven principles. These come from deep community organizers, like um, all kinds of community-based organizations use these principles, but they're participatory principles that come out of Paulo Freire. There's uh, participatory principles that come from our elders. All kinds of, this is about probably 300 years worth of wisdom that we're, tr we're sort of condensing. So we didn't make this up, but what we are doing is taking those principles and applying them to how we do work on impact and data and results. So that's the special sauce we're about to talk about. The first principle has to do, um, you can see, I'm not used to just having my back to people, so <laughs> we struggle with that. I know, I know. Is that people. it's not enough for us to define impact in a way that this group of people, or even your department directors, believe is critical. It's if we don't have the collective, both the staff inside the organizations as well as community residents and members at organ nonprofit organizations, if we don't collectively understand uh, what impact looks like and co-define it, and then also look at the data and say, I know it says it looks good, Portland, but actually the community is saying it's not, nothing's changing, so what's that distinction? So we need to use participatory principles throughout our data work. And I don't just mean we go and survey the community once, once a year. We, sur we survey again. We make sure we know what community's thinking. I actually mean that whoever we're looking to make a difference for, whether it's staff of color that work for the city, or it's folks who live in the community, or community-based organizations that serve staff of uh, people of color, that in, in whatever case it's in, those individuals not just uh, f help us collect the data, but also help us define the impact that we want to have. So what is the difference we could make and then when we look at the data later, tell us whether it makes sense or not. and helps us do an analysis of those data. And this matters for a couple of reasons. One, what happens when you're a part of the process? What, is, what does that bring out in you? You own it. That's right. There's ownership and trust. Another thing is you cannot, if, if we really believe in racial equity work, we have to truly in our hearts believe that the people themselves know the problem, know when something's not working, and know the solution, and that we are the conduits through which that happens. Our expertise, our power, our position is the thing that brings the resources to the folks who actually know the problem and the solution. They may not know all the details and the ins and outs and how it's gonna work, and so if that's true, they need to be the ones who help us define impact and help us tell us when things are working and not working, and we don't do that. And I've seen over and over again with cities that go in with their fancy annual reports and their budget reports and their performance measures and their outcomes that they think are the right ones fall flat in community. Mm -hmm. And if you actually are in conversation with community about the performance measures, you may actually say, you know what, and this was a wonderful exchange to see you great colleagues trying to figure out the cannabis issue, promises kept 
may actually be a more important performance measure than how much money our budget is growing by, as an example. That's right. That's right. We'd like to spend more time, but unfortunately we can't, so we're going to keep going. Um, the second is about punitive data culture. And this is really hard, because in order for your department directors and department staff to feel like they're allowed to be honest about what's really happening, they have to feel like when they bring that data into an environment that you're not going to freak out when it looks bad. So the thing about punitive data culture is as soon as we're born, we're given a number about our weight, about our uh, length. I found out babies count their length. I had to learn about that because I don't have any children. So I was like, what's about this baby length thing? But anyway. Um, <laughs> also, you know, as soon as they go to school, it's about developmental readiness, all this stuff. So we, we count and we count and we count. The thing about data culture is that often the standard upon which we, we name things is not necessarily just a, you know, a health standard that comes from knowing that a one pound baby is going to struggle. It's actually based on some assumptions we make about what's good and bad. Okay? And sometimes that's based in some kind of um, uh, culture around uh, white institutional culture or other classes, cultures, and other kinds of cultures that are really deeply rooted in our institutions. So sometimes we need the data look to, to look bad. Sometimes we need to know that the data is looking in a certain direction so that we can change it. But if we're too scared to actually look at the data, or if the standard upon which uh, the data is being uh, measured is something that is actually biased towards white folks or towards able-bodied folks or whatever it is, um, we can't actually have a real conversation. We can only say it looks like failure. So for us to be able to start to have a conversation that's honest about data, we have to be clear that when something looks bad, that the question we ask is not whose fault is it and everybody starts, you know, if you can't see me, I'm hiding behind a screen, hiding and denial, but actually like why, is the, why did that happen? What's going on? Because sometimes you might say we want less co police complaints. But actually, if communities of color aren't calling the police because they don't believe that the police will come or they're afraid that the police will inflict violence, then we actually want those complaints to go up. But we don't know that because as soon as the data looks red and scary, we stop the conversation. So in order for us to do this, we have to have a commitment to non-punitive data culture. Well, and yes, do we have, I, I, I want to stop you on that because, yes, I mean, I've, I've got a great example of this. Yes, so. please. And I'm glad the mayor's on a break uh, because uh, so the police bureau does these reports sure. that show that 54% of the stops that they make mm -hmm. with their gun violence reduction team mm -hmm. are of people who are African American. Mm -hmm. We live in a city with a 6% 6%. African American population. Now, you know, I'm not uh, a doctorate. But it's not rocket science to be able to do the math and That's know right. that we don't have enough African Americans that fit the category right. that police say would be gang members mm -hmm. to actually justify them being 54 That's percent right. of the stuff. That's right. Now, I get accused of being anti-cop because I just say it just doesn't add up. That's right. right? And the fact that there's no deep analysis That's about right. why that is. Oh is ex extremely frustrating. Yes, so to your point, Thank you, this is data collected by this institution, right. presented every year, right? Uh, and it's presented as if, you know, that's just the way it, it is, is right? right? So Thank you. help. <laughs> this is, uh, we always know there's going to be somebody who's going to like blow it out of the park <laughs> because it's like, so we are going to talk about something called root cause analysis mm. in the, just about 20, 30 minutes. All right. So if you don't mind, I'll still be here. No. thank you. Okay. That'd be great. And, <laughs> I, and I know that we're supposed to, that we invite the commissioners to stay till five since we um, ended um, late in the last session, which will uh -huh. start at 2.30. So if y'all, if you could stay till five, that would be great. And if you can't, we of course understand. Um, and mayor. Okay, the third is a practice that doesn't prove or blame communities for institutional failures. And I know we don't do this intentionally, but oftentimes when something doesn't work, in, behind our, in, in our heads we're thinking, why don't those department heads just hire more people of color? We told them, just hire more people of color, and yet every year we come and we, you know, so the... the but why don't those parents just bring them kids to... We funded the program. Yeah, why don't we're, they just bring you know, them? It's those people, right. those parents, yeah. right? They're just not yeah. interested. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Or they're just not in compliance, or they just don't know what's good for them, or and, 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 and. So even if we don't say it out loud, blaming community and uh, communities, whether they are our staff communities or they are communities who live in, our, in Portland, I guess those are the same people, but you know what I mean, yeah. folks who don't work for the city. Um, we, do this we don't do this intentionally, but we do it anyway. And so this is a chance, when we use this uh, analysis, it's a chance for us to look, do some inward looking using root cause analysis to decide what we can do differently. Okay, 
Just a couple more principles, Commissioner and Mayor. I know it's a lot. It's the end of the day, but we really appreciate your, um, you, sitting, you staying with us. This is only midday for me. <laughs> <laughs> Got you, Mayor. <laughs> Are you going home early today? <laughs> I'm on jet lag, so I'll be in bed by 8. <laughs> but I hear you. Okay, data is shared with the community regardless of outcome. Say it again. Data is shared with the community regardless of outcome. outcome. Right. How many times does the city do a survey, a needs assessment, an internal report, a focus group, and not come back to yeah. the community? It inflicts harm. It really inflicts harm. Even if the data is ugly, even if it's messy, how many times do you do a report, do you have consultants come in and not share it with the community? So this is a fundamental principle about the transparency, about not being afraid of the data. You have to come back to the community with respect to the data. And, I, and when Theo says it causes harm, uh, one of the reasons it causes harm is because do people know when something's not working for them? Mm -hmm. Like if your staff said, oh, thank you so much for that new system, it's terrible. Or if the community members inside of Portland say, thank you so much for the opportunity to apply, this policy looks great except I can't access it. Mm -hmm. Like people know when something's not working. We don't know why it's not working necessarily, but we do know that we often don't share data, but people know anyway. And the other reason is, what do we lose when we don't share? When something doesn't work and we pretend it worked, what do we lose? Credibility. Absolutely. And trust. So again, we want to make sure that the community knows, whatever community we're talking about, whether it's internal community here with the city or external, that we, we share data. Get the answer to the next one. <laughs> the fifth one, and this one is near and dear to my heart. We also, uh, commissioners and mayor, I don't know if you often hear the term continuous quality improvement. But it basically means we use data in real time. And why might we do that instead of waiting till something's over? So you can make corrections? Yeah, so you can make oh, corrections. Sorry. I jumped that in. Was the mayor was going to answer. Oh, that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> mayor, please. What were you going to say? So that you can make changes. <laughs> it evolves with the changing need. Or if you see you need a course correction, That's right. you have the opportunity to make it. <laughs> well done. Maybe well done. Yeah, well done, commissioners and mayor. There's another reason that we want to do this, too. And this is something when we talk about uh, course corrections, we think sometimes that not making a course correction might just mean something's ineffective, right? So we try something. We try it. We try it. I'm coming towards you. Don't worry, Markeisha. <laughs> but... We try, we get to Marquisha and it hasn't worked. Oh no, okay, we might have lost some resources and we're, this is taxpayer dollars, we don't wanna waste resources. But the other reason to, to use data in real time, and I don't mean 100 more data points because nobody has time for that. I've heard you, Mayor, you, don't, no, you all don't have time for that. And I know your staff don't have, and department heads don't have time for that. It's a couple data points, but the reason we need to do it is when it comes to racial equity, we're talking about people's lives. So making a mistake or not doing something you said you're gonna do or testing something out without course correcting causes harm. At the least, harm it causes might be trust. And you know that the community trust is critical. But it also causes harm because whatever is not getting done, that opportunity that's not happening, the, the training that's not happening to make staff more culturally competent, whatever you are intended with that action, if you are now not delivering on it, it is causing harm because whatever that is needed. You're a, we're a city. We're not doing luxury items. Y'all aren't producing iPhones, which some people might say is not a luxury item, but that's neither here nor there because we, we work in some high, high, <coughs> high income places. Can I suggest another thing related to yes, that? Yes, And it gets back to the other ones. If, if you don't have the data on a consistent basis, then you're actually missing out on the community input. No, I'm sorry. That's right. You're missing out on the community <laughs> input that might That's right. actually offer you suggestions or, or course right. corrections or ideas mm -hmm. on, on where where things can be improved. Yep. If things become stagnant. That's right. Mm -hmm. Not only stagnant, but actually unresponsive, right? Mm -hmm. So again, we want to get out of this notion that there is like a there is like the base and then we move from there. That if we are not moving, we are actually doing harm. I know it's a hard thing to imagine, but that if the community is not engaged, that whatever we're coming up with is not as good as if the community was engaged. And because of that, we are misusing resources. The community actually needs to be engaged. But even if it's not a community project, let's say it's a departmental head process, if the department heads are a part of the, the process in, and you're getting data in real time, you could be causing actual harm. Yes, yes Commissioner. I have one to add. Please. So if we're going to stick with the metaphor of the moving train, then we have to recognize that the situation on the ground is dynamic yes. and our approaches need to be Love it. dynamic. 
I mean, we've okay. made the mayor's office and my office wrote a renewables resolution that was uh, one of the most aggressive in the whole country two years ago. And sorry, Mayor, I think it's already out of date because right. we have new we have new data. Right. That's right. Um, That's so, right. Yeah. That's right. And it doesn't mean that the impact we want to see changes. It right. doesn't mean that collectively the commissioners and the mayor plus all of the department heads can't come up with a center, a central set of impact measures that you come together around. But to your point, Commissioner, how we get there is mm -hmm. a constant moving And it target. doesn't mean that you have to have perfect data. Because oftentimes when we work with elected officials, like, well, Theo, that sounds all great, but we don't have the data. Right. We don't have it now. We can't disaggregate by this. We don't know about our East Asian pop. And so we will get to the tool in a way that you don't have to have the perfect data in order to be able to do that continuous improvement. We never do. Exactly. Never. That's right, right Commissioner. Well, and isn't that an excuse a lot of times yes. for non-movement? That's right. right. We don't know enough about it yet. Let's That's put right. a study group together. That's right. That's, That's right. right, Commissioner. Okay, just two more principles and then I promise we'll get to the tool. All right. The, the sixth one, and commissioners and mayor, this is probably the most important thing that we want you to focus on today, is that we use root cause analysis to define what solutions we're going to use. So, what this means is, let's say we, 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 def we know that there is um, a, a racial inequity in our community. So if, if you all don't mind, just something that you know is true for, for communities of color, particular community of color, if you don't mind giving us an example. Let's try to stick something that we haven't talked about yet. Yeah, one Houselessness. Disparity. What is it? Houselessness. 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 Okay. So when it comes to um, folks of color, is there a gap? So is it disproportionately true? So there's proportionately more people of color who have houselessness than they exist in the community. Right, so maybe double, is it double houselessness? Something like that? It's more than that. More than that. It's probably triple that okay. because yeah. I think it's a direct relationship to the police conversation, right? If okay. people get arrested, chances are then they have a harder time getting an apartment, which means that they have this record that's following them and Got just it. exacerbates. Great. I mean, not great. No, but, yeah, but. But thank you for that data point. Okay. Oh, together. thank you. I got you. <laughs> we did the same thing. Double. So here's the thing we usually do, um, and I don't know who your favorites are, but we usually go to this shelf of best practices. This, it could be as big as the chamber here. And we say, okay, what are they doing in Denver? What are they doing in Seattle? What are they doing in San Francisco? And what are they doing in Boston? And we say, what are they doing about houselessness and other, houselessness in other places? And we say, huh. Evidence says this works, um, and we've tried this in the past, and it kind of works, so we should try that. We, we, we come up with a solution, and we think maybe this time it'll work, and we go like this, and maybe we do something just more of it. We, we, did, we built housing. It was affordable housing. Let's just build 20 times more. I was actually an assistant commissioner in the New York City Department of Homeless Services, mm -hmm. and I had uh, 60,000 homeless people in our system. So I, believe me, I get it. I picked the right topic then, didn't I? <laughs> yes, you did. But actually, houselessness and displacement, these things are interconnected when racial equity comes into play. Is that exactly. right? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Fritz. OK, so instead of that beautiful chamber of like li library, what we do is we ask the question, why? Why is it that there's triple the rate of homelessness for people of color than for others? I mean, based, at least not for others, based on their proportionate numbers in the community. Why? And if we don't ask why first, we will actually come up with a solution that is relatively baked and also may or may not have anything to do with why it exists here in Portland. So if, we, if you don't mind, um, commissioners, and we'll do this in just a couple of minutes, but just name some reasons why people of color in Portland have homelessness at triple the rate than, they live in, than their numbers um, are. They are disproportionately represented in low income communities, they are discriminated against in housing. Hold on one second. Um, discrimination. They've been denied educational equity. Education. I'm Red sorry. Line. Red <laughs> line. A couple more. Joanne, you want to jump in? History of redlining. Good. OK, and so we'll, we'll go into this a little bit more. Yeah. But so if what we did was if we build more housing. Yeah. Um, and we, we would go down or actually. Or give people vouchers. Give them give vouchers, yeah. that's right. That'll solve um, <laughs> First of all, actually, before we do that, so why are people of color in Portland more discriminated against than other folks in, when it comes to, yes? Because when Oregon became a state, it, uh, first order of business was to pass a law that prohibited black folks from living here. And why was that? Why did that happen? Uh, because it was created as a white homeland, and 
that's the way they wanted it to be. White utopia, okay. I think, is the okay. yeah. Yes. And yes. while, so we have that history in Oregon, and truth be known, it, whether it happened explicitly or implicitly in other places, there were things put on the books to explicitly do things like that. So we, we have that history. Why else is discrimination happening now? Are we allowed to just say racism? Sure. That's down here. <laughs> no, but, you can't say that. So, so <laughs> but, but, right quick, we like, but, but down here is racism. It's gonna, mm -hmm. okay. We're talking about folks of color. There's lots of roots in racism. Right. Help me get from... There, there is the experience of discrimination. Discrimination is real for folks of color, and it's rooted in racism. But what's happening between racism and, I mean, discrimination and racism? Is are there actors playing a role? Are landlords doing something? Uh, our job. Wh what's happening? Well, I would, I have to go back one, which is sure. People of color are overrepresented in our prison population, or you know, coming over here, due to racist uh, top level laws, especially around drug. Uh, drug laws, and then we have the media. Oh, oh, giving me up here, but help me over here, Commissioner. I think I'm getting to it. So the media has created a completely yeah, skewed impression in the public of crime and, and who is doing crime. And why does the media in Portland do that? Well, I'm talking about the media in general, but okay, the media in, in Portland. Um, yeah, why would the media in Portland do well, that? Because nationally, uh, media has been consolidated, so they only okay. print and report on press release. And who has staff that send press releases to the media all day? Please. Okay. <laughs> and who? And why else? So the media wants to. Oh, why else does the media I portray mean, folks of color? I mean, human beings have a negativity bias. Okay. And I think what is the. Um, if it leads, it bleeds. Thank you. If it bleeds, oh, it bleeds. yes. Good. My so, so, so they want to sell papers. They want okay. to sell papers. Not that there's Click, papers anymore, but. Clickbait. Okay. You know, I'm going to venture to guess that most of our um, journalists in Portland are white, so they've got their own implicit bias. Good. And why are most journalists in Portland white? Because most of the people who own the stations are white. So the people who, who people white people hire other white people. They Edu hire people. Why that do white people hire other hire white people? people they're comfortable with. Because that's who they went to college with. Comfort. That's who they grew up Good. next door to. Networks. That's, okay, so yeah. I'm going to stop us here just for one second because we're going to practice more when it comes well to. Done. Yeah. They're warm. <laughs> they're warm. <laughs> okay, let's well keep going then. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So here's the thing. We would do this for all of these high level. Why are folks of color more low income? And these things overlap. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to make it to sound like everything is clean and siloed. But we would come up with a list of whys up here, for Portland specifically. And to, to your point, some of it is national in scope. And we would dig down. And could your, Commissioner Fritz, is that? Yes? OK. Commissioner Fritz says, well, can't we just say racism? No, no, no. We can't just say racism. That's we actually have to go down a ladder. Because at each level is a potential location for an intervention that's related to the root cause. Now, this seems pretty big and macro when it comes to all of Portland. You all are at that level, commissioners and mayors. So the cool thing is we're with the right people for population level change. Your departments have actually just gone through a process, and we'll talk about it in a couple minutes, where they have defined um, all kinds of things at a very macro level, and we have the opportunity to actually put all of that together and say, what, would it, what does it look like, not just for each department. We're going to talk about it in a couple minutes. But the key to this exercise is this. If we said, um, uh, let's just say white folks hire other white folks because it's comfortable for them, at, or it's who they went to college with. It's just, tr this is what, something we know. We could actually change something about that. Mm. We may not be able to go and say, a big media outlets, like you now need to redirect your stories, but we may be able to say, what's the stories that we want to come into our, our situations, into our environment? What are the things that we want to be highlighting? But we can also do something about white networks. We can, because that's just something that we know we have more relationship to when it comes to our individual um, uh, relationships to who, who we purchase from, uh, who we hire, all kinds of things. So we can do a root cause analysis, and you're saying, how is that going to change the, tr the rate of ho houselessness for POC? Well, it's not just one action. We're not going to pick one thing down here. We're going to figure out where are those key components, and what you will notice in root cause analysis, like a node will begin to start, where a lot of things start to converge, 
And that's a place where we could really make a big difference. And we're going to practice it. Yes, Commissioner. So um, I wanted to go back to Commissioner uh, Fritz's question about racism. Yes. I think the reason that you don't want to start there is because people close off as soon as you mention racism, right? It's so a fair point. Uh, it's a kind of a, it's a uh, get out of jail free card. Oh, I, I'm not racist. So I don't actually have to listen to this stuff, right? That's right. Yeah. No, the, the reason I asked the question is also because that's a, a pretty broad term, and I appreciate you making us go through what are the steps to to break that down because it's also just as a shutting off question it's a oh it's racism so Done. good we've got it finished right Do, it's like ending world hunger right yeah could we take a moment to elaborate on the white utopia a little bit because sure. <laughs> it's something i think about in regards to disability as well as racism uh, because the black community or the um, visibly disabled community are relatively small compared to the dominant culture, and because uh, those communities, well, the black community has been very, very, very segregated, and the disability community is almost is also hidden for other reasons. I don't feel like the average Portlander has really had the opportunity to learn how to live side by side. Okay. Uh, with other cultures or with peer, people experiencing differences, it gives them the sense that whiteness is the norm, uh -huh. is the standard, and being black or being disabled is a deviation. And uh, media bias, absolutely, you know, we've got cultural and class differences as okay. well, and then the media bias, so it's all kind yes. of feeds into each other. And to your point, Commissioner, what I'll say is when we talk about segregation, you would say, why is there, why, excuse me, discrimination? Why is there discrimination? Well, actually, what we know is that white Portlanders don't often interact with, uh, with Portlanders of color. And I heard you say, Anything. because of racial, uh, residential segregation, but also because of numbers. Why is that? And then you say, well, so how does that impact uh, folks of color? And then you say, well, there's this idea of white, uh, white utopia, yeah. right? And so we keep going down. We don't just sort of say stuff. Because if we don't have a relationship that gets under and under and under and under till we get to racism or ableism or whatever it is. We talk about race. We, fo we center race. Um, we believe it's, the, it's a way that we can uh, stop the displacement of what's happening. But we know there's intersectional views on this. But again, we want to go dig down in a very rigorous and disciplined way rather than just sort of spectrum. So I really appreciate that example. And importantly, there's not just one route. So you two commissioners may go in on the utopia. You may have solidarity in that. But it gets dicey when we do this. And some folks may have an aversion to that. But we just, we just took one. And so there will be other routes that other folks will be able to see themselves even more powerfully. Because you can see it's not just one route that's at the why of this. And sometimes a route is technical. That's the way we've designed the law. That's the way we've created a legislation. Why? We don't actually know why we did it that way. It just is. So if we know it's actually a technical thing, Sometimes it's a little simple thing we can do as, as commissioners and mayor. And then other times it's something like, ooh, <laughs> white utopian, like this, and that is a culture thing. That is something that deeply lives in our bodies and in our experiences, and that takes longer. And there, there's no doubt that the, commissioner, the, the commissioners and the mayor can't do it alone. There's no doubt about that, but you have a role to play. That's the key about this kind of analysis. So we're going to talk about our final point, which is number seven, very quickly, but very importantly. And I will just like again ra like ra raise up the brilliance of your departments and their staff for really being able to embody this, which is that we cannot talk about data in a really serious way without building trust and relationship. Because anytime we use data that's not built around trust and relationship, our, and, and it looks bad, it, it becomes this moment where we really want to hide from it, or we want to dismiss it, or we want to get away from it. But actually, when we build trust, we can embrace those uh, negative or, or scary data points and actually do what we just did. Say, it's only 20%. We wanted it to be an 80% and it's only 20. Why, 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 why? And we dig down under it and then solve for it. Um, our communities have not been um, a part of the conversation. And so when data comes at them, um, it comes at them. And it actually looks like we are blaming you for the problem. Same could happen with our departments. Same could happen with the community-based organizations we work with. And so the key is, what's the relationship we build that's focused on impact, not focused on whether I like you. Yeah. We don't have to have happy hour. We don't have to come to your, your daughter's graduation. No, no, no. We have a relationship around impact and a commitment to it in such a way that we are willing to work together to actually make sure that that impact stays center. So relationship, relationship, relationship. I want so, you to do if you can't, yes, have, if you can't have that. 
What if you can't? Yes, if there's, a, if there's an entity that um, perceives its job to be just telling us what we've done wrong and, what the, and blaming us for the data. Um, the way we see the answer to that is that we start with who we do have. We actually begin with a little bit of a choir um, as a core group. And then we identify the partners we need, and that's actually step number five of the methodology, that have a role to play, even if we can't have them right away. Even if, it's a, if there's somebody that we can't stand. I've been in places where there's the, either the corporate sector or a particular nonprofit or a, a part of government where they feel like they are such naysayers, but without them, they, they are stuck. Mm -hmm. And so we, step um, five of the process mm -hmm. says, who are the partners with the role to play? And we create strategies sub-strategies to get those people to come to the table. It might mean that um, commissioner uh, has a relationship through your uncle in DC, or it might be that we just have to slowly over the next two years begin to have a conversation. And, and, and sometimes they're not gonna be um, aligned with our ethics, and yet we need them to contribute to the impact in a particular way. So sometimes we give up on the ethic part, and we just say, can you do this thing? And over time, what we've seen is people do come to the table. Um, and there are, we have lots of examples, and we can share them with you about uh, especially private sector and government um, partners who have been slowly able to join more as partners. But in the beginning, you start with kind of the core. Thank you. Because if you start a process where this is not at the core, you'll go nowhere. You'll go nowhere. So commissioners and mayor, are you ready for the actual methodology now? Yes. That was just talking about yes. the methodology. Let us have it. Mayor, are you ready for it? Is it OK? Can we ready go there? Go. <laughs> Crowd, can we talk about the methodology now? Are we good? <laughs> yes, thank you. OK, you warmed us up. All right. Because again, we didn't want to use a tool, crash through these windows, and do some harm. We want to use the tool responsibly. Those are the principles for it. OK, so a slide that says key ideas. The first key idea, do you want to do the first one? I mean, it relates to the principle. This is about decision making. This is not about reporting. This is not about compliance. This is about using the data that shows up through the tool to make better decisions. That's right. And also, just so you know, Mark Friedman created results-based accountability about 25 years ago. It didn't have a racial equity lens. So we've been doing work now for um, 10, 12 years now to embed it and use it. So now it's really good. But before, it was just RBA. So if you look it up, it doesn't have racial equity in it. So again, for decision making. Second, it's an ends to means process. Um, is there any reason why I can't walk throughout the room nope. in here for any well, security reasons? OK. <laughs> I'm from New York City, so we take these things very seriously. OK. So if over here, we say we want all Portlanders. Is that the right word? OK, yeah, OK. Portlanders to be, oh, hi. We want all Portlanders to be healthy. Does anybody think that's a bad idea? We want all Portlanders to be healthy. No. Nope. What we usually do is we go to our shelf of health mm -hmm. strategies. And we say, which one will make Portlanders healthy? And we say, what's, one of, what's an example of a health strategy we might employ? Immunizations. Immunizations, every good. Every child gets a immunization, and now every Portlander is healthy. So um, tax. What is it? Soda tax. Good Soda one. tax is another one. We also hear things like farmer's markets. Now, is there anything wrong with immunizations? So, Well, I'm not going to get into the tax question. <laughs> farmer's Sorry. markets. We think these things are good. Right. There's no reason why these don't necessarily improve health. Right. But what we don't do is a, is a process that moves from my friends here in the back over here by Claire and slowly works our way to the right set of solutions that address our problem. We don't know why it is the way it is. We just, we, with our urgency and our commitment to the population that we, our community, our taxpayers, let's try this, let's try this. And, and in, in, in England or in LA, they're doing this thing. Finland is a big one for education. Do it. And so this process is an ends to means process that by the time we come over to you, commissioners and mayor, we actually have a sense of why it is the way it is. We have community buy-in. And now we have a set of solutions that have a chance. And sometimes we can't do them by ourselves. Sometimes we need partnerships. And so that's included in the process. Mm -hmm. The second point we want you to know about is that RBA distinguishes between everybody um, making a difference for everybody, all people in Portland are healthy, and the work that happens inside of the Department of Public Health or a project level. So we, we call that population level, that's everybody in Portland, or performance level, something that's happening in emergency services, or the whole, you know, anything that has a formal name. 
is at the performance level. We don't want to confuse that. It's not fair to you all to say we believe that, um, for your departments especially, we want everybody in Portland to have a good education. And yet, is it just the Department of Education's challenge? No. There, who else plays a role besides the Department of Education to make sure everybody's well educated in, in Portland? Transportation. Transportation, who else? Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec. Mm -hmm. People that are not part of government. Think, help me think outside the box, outside of mm -hmm. government. After school programs. After school programs, who else? Babysitters. Babysitters. Parents. 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 Families. Coaches. 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 Mentors. People that provide food in the community. Could Great be the community. Right? And so what we do is we often say, the gov city government is failing because education is failing. And, and, and we have a role to play in government. But actually, this process allows us to see what's our slice of the pie, and then what's your slice of the pie. Let's come together. And we're going we're gonna to come together on our slice of the pie. We're going to be clear about it. But it's not the same as population level change. We don't promise population level change by ourselves. We can't. We just said all those other groups are involved. So we have to partner. So it's different. Performance level says, OK, Commissioner, you have these four departments that are un how many does everybody have? Departments? It varies. I have two. It varies. OK, two, five, three, whatever it is. OK, here are your departments. And in each department, here are the performance that they are each responsible for that all contribute to education. Great. Now we know at least I know what my slice of the pie is. And so it distinguishes between those things. Population is everybody, needs a lot of partners. Performance is my slice of the pie. And commissioners and mayor, if people work together, we have to believe that the sum of the parts is greater than the separate pieces. If, um, is, who's in the house? We have Mike, what, what department are you with? And somebody else, another department over here. Yeah. Parks and if environmental services and parks and rec actually work together, it's not that one plus one equals two. Mm -hmm. It's that one plus one actually equals three, or sometimes five, if they do it well. So we have to believe that, and that's part of performance measure, and that's part of results-based accountability. We have to believe in partnerships. So if you don't believe that, if you think y'all can do it alone, I know you don't think you can do it alone. I'm pretty sure, because I see the kind of work that you do. But it's part of the process. And it takes time. One of the greatest books on the civil rights movement is that freedom, it's called freedom, is an endless meeting. And so to your point about trust, this is a dynamic process. It takes time. It takes a lot of time with those partnerships. Now here's we're going to get more technical. Coming back over here, friends. Remind me of your name? Andres. Andres. OK, over here by Andres is step one. And we work backwards. Nobody trip me, please. There's seven <laughs> steps, seven steps finally, until we get to the solution. There's seven steps. So your, your departments are actually at about, they're actually at the end of the first seven steps. And they're now moving into performance, OK? And we're about to go share those tomorrow for two days. We're working all together to look at what's their population level seven steps. They've already built them all out, compare them, say, where are the commonalities, and then dig into their real work, OK? That's what we're about to do. Seven steps, but there's three primary questions. And again, if you don't remember anything besides root cause analysis, which we just did, we hope you'll remember the next thing. I love this part. I'm just going to breathe for a second. My favorite. <laughs> favorite. Take this is like this is, the first question you'll see at the top of the page on the second page. Next, next page. No, no, you're at it right, Commissioner Fritz. Yeah, that one right there, right here. This one right here. No, yeah. Not the picture, right here. That, ah, that this one. one. Yep. The first question asks us to be clear about how much stuff we do how many dollars we spend, how many people we serve, how many units we build, how many people we hire. It's a quantity, OK? We're used to this. We count all the time. It's generally how we get funded from the state. It's generally how we ask people, Did you, you said you were going to do 100 or something. You did 100 or something. Here's your money, right? We're used to those numbers. The second question is about how well we do our job. And, and the key is oftentimes there's a model we're following or a set of uh, something that we know means it's high quality. It could be like the budget got completed in a timely fashion. We said it would be done by, when does the budget have to be done by? The date? June, Next week. June 18th. <laughs> June 18th, and by God, we got it done by June 18th. That's a quality measure. It's a day it says, early. <laughs> if you do it early, that's even greater. I mean, if it tells you maybe it's even higher quality. But. Commissioners and mayor, the thing that we're really getting clear about in the departments 
is that in fact it does not matter how much stuff we do. Maybe politically it matters, I understand that. And it literally, and it also doesn't matter, unfortunately, how well we do it unless we know if it made a difference. If it made a difference, especially in the lives of people of color. And so the key for us is to stop measuring success based on quantity and to begin measuring success on whether or not people are better off as a result. And sometimes we get tripped up because of the, the political expedience and the urgency of our work, and we believe in it so deeply, we want to be responsive, but we're only counting how much we do and how well we do it. And so it's difficult because often that requires time, it requires asking people, hey, commissioner, if I did a good job, how would I know it? And you're the client, right? Right now, you all are my client, therefore, you would have to tell me what it means if I did a good job. The client, the community tells, tells you this is what impact would look like, or your staff would. But again, it doesn't matter how much we do, and it doesn't matter how well we do it if it doesn't make a difference in the lives of people or, or departments or staff. It does, and, and it's and a very hard transition. particularly people of color. That's right. Right? And so if you think about the route where you all went, and we, amazing city, Portland. Amazing city, San Francisco. Highest performing school district in the country. You know, beautiful, glorious city. But if you ask Portlanders of color, is anyone better off as a result of the budget? Is anyone better off as a result of the partnership? That's the, that's, and that's the uncomfortable space that we sit in with results-based accountability with the racial equity lens. And you have to sit there if you're actually serious about that data point. Right. Is anyone better off? Because you can, smart enough to talk yourself into how much, it's a $5 billion budget, it's early, it's on time, deficits, all these different things. We but asked 100 people. We asked 100 people. We did community meetings. We did that, just like the mayor said. But, but what he's getting blown up on his phone is different than what people are saying in the chambers. Right. And so, like, who actually is better off as a result of it? And who do you listen to to answer that question? That's right. Yep, and we'll, 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 we'll get there. We're going to practice that a little bit on performance measures. That was it's a good. great question. It's a really good question. I'm going to write that question time. Down. Because oftentimes, the loudest voice in the room, the gatekeepers, yes. the, you know, the, the folks who, who, who have access to the community are the ones who, who, who get what they want. Yeah. And, and that's, that's not what we're talking yes. about. Yeah, when I was a assistant commissioner in homeless services in New York City, we got a lot of complaints that called in about homeless folks on the street. But actually, the majority of our homeless families, were there were 45,000 out of the 60,000, were women and children of color who were in unstable housing throughout the city. And those weren't the ones we were getting calls about. It was actually people like, um, this looks bad on our city, and this is a business, and I don't want these people outside front. Or it could be just people that had to walk and pass folks. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not that those things don't both matter. Sorry, it's a data point. It's, it's a data point. It just is a, it's truly a data point, and we have to say to ourselves, is anyone better off as a result of this thing, and who? Right? Um, and we ask a bunch of people, how would I know you're better off? How would I know you're better off? How would I know you're better off? Um, but at the, at the end of the day, um, I'll give you one more example. Um, if we are doing a hiring practice, and I don't know about you all, but I, I know that every institution I know of does not sufficiently have folks of color in leadership roles. It's just the case all over the country in a proportionate number. Um, if we know that to be true, and we just hire a bunch of folks, oh boy, look, we did it. We hired 100 people of color. Well, if you ask folks of color, um, how do we know you're be we're better off at your job? They might say, yes, of course, I, I got a job. And I'm in a, in a managerial position. But they might also say, when I'm at my job, I feel respected. They might also say, um, I want to stay. Um, and that you might actually look at retention rates as well. So again, we just have to get real clear that the people who, we, who know the most about the problem and the know most about the solution and what impact looks like are the people we're actually serving. Um, white folks. In New York City, we, are the, we, are, we have much higher income than folks of color in New York City on average. Um, what better off looks like for me, uh -huh. a homeowner in midtown Manhattan, is very different from what better off is going to look like for a person of color who is experiencing uh, the damaging effects of poor schooling in the South Bronx. It doesn't mean that person doesn't want a stable home life. It just means what I'm focused on is very different. So we need to think about whose voice is loud. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Yep. OK, so, I'll, so commissioners, if you don't mind looking at the slide, that's a picture. The boat. So we just want to practice a little more. <laughs> commissioners, everyone able to read the text on there, or should we read it out loud? Sure glad the hole isn't at our end. OK. And it is not intentional. I did not make this drawing, but it is not intentional who is in the boat. That is just, they are just people that somebody drew. 
So do not take, make meaning of the fact that they all look like white guys. That is not intentional. So what's happening in this picture, commissioners and mayor? The boat is sinking. Mm -hmm. Thank you, mayor. And what's, what else is happening? <laughs> and two guys are kicked back because they're like, my name is Bennett and I'm not in it. So as long as those guys keep working, I'm not sinking, right? <laughs> two guys are chilling in the back. What's happening at the bottom of the boat? They're desperately bailing out the water that's, that's right. going to sink them all. Yep. Who does it remind you of, commissioners and mayor? Well, who could be at the top and who could be at the bottom? All different kinds of groups could be at the top and the bottom. But what are, who are some of them? I would say people of color are the ones trying to bail out the boat. There you go. Because they're always trying to like just survive, That's right? right. And, and you could have white folks or rich folks, right. or whoever it rich is. Rich folks are kicked back just there saying, why aren't they working harder? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Right. Who else could it be though? I want yeah. us to like think about all of our systems. Yes. People who are living in areas of our city that are more environmentally degraded and are having um, much worse health outcomes. Got it. And people who are living in more healthy areas. Mm -hmm. Who else could it be? Those are mayors bailing. And those are <laughs> <laughs> That's our United States Congress. OK, there you go. <laughs> Wait, I was wondering who's going to be at the top. But I got you, Mayor. Yes, thank you. Who else? Who else could be at the top and the bottom? Renters and landlords. Renters, Renters and, and landlords, landlords. yeah. Who else? I I'll let you know. Um, commissioners and mayor that sometimes we had in a room of managers and mid, mid and staff people saying those are the managers mm -hmm. and here's us down here. Mm -hmm. I also heard different departments say there's public health and there's education, right? Mm -hmm. Two different departments. And even in one department, there's the budget office and there's the folks that are delivering service or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So like even inside of our dynamics, we can see how this stuff could play out. Mm -hmm. um, but what's not happening in the picture? Not everyone is contributing to the solution. Uh -huh. What else is not happening? There's They're not all going to die. <laughs> They're all getting sick. That's right. Mm -hmm. And how long could that boat stay afloat? As long as those guys' arms don't wear out. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> front, and what happens right? if they wear out? Uh, Systems level. What happens if they wear out? Or if they wear out, then they're all going down. Uh huh. But right. you can replace them. Right. At a systems level. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. What so else is not happening? Boat's not being rowed. It's not going anywhere. That's right. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody's coming in to help. Nobody's coming to help. Mm -hmm. These guys aren't asking for help. They're not asking for anything. Mm -mm. You know what's not happening? They're not asking the question, why is the boat sinking? Mm -hmm. Right. They are just doing what they do. Right. And what they've always done. My mom is a social worker. She has always been bailing folks out, in fact. And actually, but her clients would say she's sort of at the top of the boat and, her, and, and, the, and the, the folks in the community are at the bottom. But they are not asking the question, why is the boat sinking? They are coming up with a solution. And let me tell you, in your departments, in your, in your own uh, bureaus. bureaus, excuse me, not departments, oh in God. your bureaus and at the commissioner and mayoral level, there are some of you that are just doing what you've always done or what you think is your job and working your butts off. And there's others of you that are just doing what you think is your job and what you've always done, which is seeing the problem from a distance. And either way, that's a solution, FYI. Those are strategies, that kind of distance, that kind of working your butts off and sweating. And I heard you say, Mayor, my, my day is going to end like in five hours, 10 hours from now. So don't even, don't even worry about me. But what we're not doing is saying, why is the boat sinking before we come up with a new solution? And we don't know if communication will help. We don't know if. If they need to move some bodies to the side of the boat, level it out. The bottom of the boat could be completely taken out by a shark. Mm -hmm. Could be a tiny little hole. We could just stuff it and get going. We don't know what's happening because we haven't asked why is the boat sinking. And so that's why root cause analysis is critical. We just wanted to give you another example of it as we move into the full methodology to remind you that better off measures and root cause analysis, this is a data point. If we look at the data in Portland for people of color, folks of color are sinking. And we are not asking enough, why, is it, why are they sinking? We are just moving into action. And it is harming folks. And when certain folks of color um, are continuously bailing themselves out, there's only so long that can happen. Because at some point, those folks of color have to leave the city. And we know displacement is not in your agenda. That is not what you're here for. So we need to ask that question seriously. 
and inside of the departments. Departments need to ask, why is it that folks of color are not experiencing our services equitably? Why our budgets aren't equitably serving people of color? Why? Um, we're just looking at, I'm looking at all the faces. Staff the retention. Staff retention is not serving people of color. Why? Um, we may have analysis that our analysts do or evaluations. It's not the same thing. Right. We're not asking why. So let's talk about the methodology really quickly. Here we are. We, got, we finally got to it, commissioner and may, commissioners and mayor. Do you want to do that? So result, and these are the terms that we're going to use. You can use different terms that you want. Nice and quick. Result is a condition of well-being for children, adults, or families, and you already practice it. It's an all-people statement. All Portlanders are healthy. All Portlanders are, are well-educated. Any other one that's really critical, do you feel all Portlanders are? Housed. Housed. Nice. Okay. What else? Just a couple more. All Portlanders are? Employed. Safe. safe. Employed safe. and safe. Anybody in the room it's know theirs idea. off the top of their head? All Portlanders are? Healthy. Healthy. We already got that. Got it. Cool. Thank okay. you. So we spend a lot of time with your bureau directors coming up with all people statements. The challenge for them, sometimes they wonder, well, what is your unified all people statement? And there could be a couple elements or more than one. It could be three. We're going to work on that tomorrow. Yep. So that's a result. An indicator would be a measure which helps quantify the result. So what would be a measure that helps quantify whether or not all Portlanders are well-educated, as an example? What would all be of it? Portland. All of Portland. What do you look at? Graduation Graduation rate. Good. BA or better? Right. Right? What about for? Well, high school completion. High then, school completion. Right? Good. Yep, well-educated. Great. Uh, redu reduction in crime. Good. That's another indicator. Excellent. Perfect. So we come up with a set of indicators that guide us to say, um, what are we really focused on and why? Because when we disaggregate those numbers, we can see disparity. Yeah. And we will see lots of kinds of disparity. It's not that there's only one form of disparity, but we're specifically interested in racial um, equity, in, in racial disparity and ethnic disparity. So we look at it from that lens. Before we jump to the indicator, what we typically do in just a quickly beautiful exercise with your Department of Transportation, they had an all people statement that all Portlanders were, are uh, using public transportation, right? And so what we ask folks to do is to take a second mm -hmm. and to pause and to say, what would it look like if all Portlanders could are- get, Could get where they wanted to go. That's are, actually the one. Are, are, are getting where they want to go. What would that actually look like? And before you say it's the percentage of people who are using bus or rail or whatever, people, people just reflected. It would be, we would see black and brown people walking. We would see Latinx people riding their bikes. We would see people smiling in parts of the city where they're not smiling. Right? So, so you get into the space. You start with your results statement, but you actually have to embody what would it look like in Portland if all people were fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And so that's the exercise to actually get, get to the result. And the final word we use is, is performance measure. And when we said how much, how well, better off, those three, mm -hmm. we call that a performance measure. So you'll hear that word. Um, and that's what we're going to be working on for the next two days, and not, not on that word, but the process associated with thinking about their own work and how their own work um, adds a slice of the pie up to one of these larger visions. Okay. So the, the next page you're going to look at says seven questions at the top. Seven questions of population accountability. And commissioners and mayor, we are not going to go through all of these because you will now go to bed if we do because <laughs> you are very tired and very busy, I'm sure. Maybe not tired, but super busy. So let me just name that. What we want you to know is it's a rigorous process to go through these questions at the population level. And you'll see some familiar uh, friends in there from what we've been talking about. The thing Theo just talked to you about, that first question, what is the condition of well-being we want for all people? We don't just ask that because it's hokey and sort of like something we can put at the top of a thing and say, we want everybody to be happy. And we, if we want everybody to be happy, we're going to find a way to measure happiness that's, that lives in the lives of people. We're going to disaggregate it by race. And then we're going to say, what's your slice of the pie? So the first question is really important. And you all struggled with it sometimes because you wanted to say, in my agency, we want everybody to use um, this particular thing. To, like, they, we want everybody to get, you know, get their immunization for their kids for pre-K. But we're talking about something that's a little bit bigger than agency level. So they had to think outside the box bigger. Um, and they came up with a lot of the same stuff. A lot of people had the same vision. And you'll see there's a set of seven steps. But you see that fourth bullet there. That's actually what we talk about root cause analysis. That's what the, what's the data and what's the root causes. Mm -hmm. So at that point, your, your uh, department heads are actually digging into, so why is it that people are spending over 30% of their income on rent? at disproportionate rates, especially for communities of color and new immigrants. Why? And they dug. 
And they probably argued to some extent, I'm sure, or they got hot inside of their bureaus thinking about this. We came back. We talked about it. Again, why? And why do we ask why? Because that's the location of a potential solution for that department. And again, you can see we keep going down, and we would talk about how we're doing, who are the partners with the role to play, bullet five, what could we do, and then finally, bullet seven, what will we do? What are the solutions? Now, you're like, but Erica, we all, they all have racial equity, or they all have racial uh, equity plans. We all know that racial equity is, is key to our work. This forces folks to embed a process that's ends to means. The key is do not pick a solution until you know the roots of the problem. And this allows them to see the systems level roots. Yes, please. So how does this tool address racial equity? Because again, if, you're, if we're not intentional, it right. doesn't happen. Well, perfect segue. So please go to the next page. <laughs> Okie doke. Now we're going to practice with you all. 15 and then 15. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want you all to think about some function of your work. It could either be something that you're working on, a policy that you really think is going to help folks of color, or that you want to implement and you want it to help everybody, but you know it, if you don't focus on folks of color, it won't help. So I want you to think about something that you're doing mm -hmm. in the city, mm -hmm. something that you're working on. You don't even have to, have to start it yet. Just an idea, or it could just be from a specific commissioner, something that you're interested in working on. You want on. us to share it? Yeah, please. So next week, I've got a policy package called FAIR coming out. It's FAIR Access and Renting, and it's aimed at decreasing barriers for people that have them in awesome. accessing rental housing. Awesome. So we're going to use a mini process to talk about how racial equity is embedded into this process. The a short answer to your question is the principles that we talked about at the beginning. At each point in this process, we are checking what are the assumptions people are making. How does that root cause analysis dig down into the, into the sort of upper levels of racism? Who are the partners we need versus who are the partners we have and all of that good stuff. So we're about to talk about that in a second. Let's talk about fair access and renting. So let's look at the first question. Who do we want this um, policy to impact? Who is the client of this policy? The beneficiary, however you want to think about it. It is all renters, but it's specifically aimed at people of color and people with disabilities. OK. So we want to look at all renters, but then we also want to disaggregate that right, by people of color and people with disabilities. OK. So if fair access and renting worked, now I want you to look at the second question. And actually, um, I don't think there's numbers on your on your no. thing. So I'll just ask you the questions. But we can to... count down the two. <laughs> oh, no, I meant like oh. page, 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 oh, okay. page. No, I don't want you to do that, because we'll, that's, that's, that's going to be hard. Okay. OK. How would you know that people of color in Portland were better off as a result of FAIR? Mm. Let's, let's do a poll now. I would like everybody, if you don't mind, commissioners and mayor, you don't have to participate, of course. For each one of you, I want you to think for just a minute. How would we know? Do you all know what FAIR is? You all know? OK. Oh, yeah. gosh, yes. OK, good. I know what it is, too, so we're in good shape. How would you know that people of color in Portland were better off as a result of FAIR? So just think about it for 30 seconds, commissioners and mayor. Just for people of color right now, and then we'll do people with disabilities. What would you see? What would you feel? What would you hear? Okay. Ten more seconds. Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Okay. So the commissioners and mayor, if you don't mind, if you don't want to share, you don't have to, but how would you know? So anyone can start. Our neighborhoods will be more diverse because more people, and specifically people of color, will have greater access to housing across the whole city. So racially diverse, specifically? Yes. Okay. Is there a particular neighborhood where you would see more people of color that maybe you don't see right now? Or would it be Maybe more than okay. yeah, I mean, okay. I could <laughs> no, that's good because you get that's... more like when I think about my 15 month old, you want this to be in like how they would how you would actually see it. So you would literally see more yes. Asian folk or black folk or brown folk walking around in every neighborhood other than East Portland. Good. So you'd look at it by neighborhood, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Good. Commissioner Fraser, awesome. did you come up with something? I don't have an answer because we don't have a baseline number, okay. so it's well, that's not. Okay. 
But um, do you have a sense if you imagine something? Just get qualitative. Don't worry about the quantitative. Don't even think about what you currently can measure. I just want you to imagine it. How would you know? And you don't have to go as well, but anybody else want to imagine? What would you know? What would you see? I would suspect that we would have greatly reduced the people of color that were arrested for being homeless. Because okay. they wouldn't be on the street, so therefore they would not be arrested for Got crimes it. associated with being Thank poor. You so much, Mike. Perfect. Reduced okay. fair housing claims. Good. Thank you. Mm. Percent fair housing claims. Anyone that, um, did you want to go, Commissioner Fitz, or you're going to pass on this one? Okay. Let's just start with these three. Um, anything that's, uh, think about anything qualitative. Qualitative, I just mean that it's not something you can count in hard numbers. It's just something that somebody might feel, experience, have an opinion about. Folks of color in Portland um, might feel something or think something different. Like, how do you know? You're, it sounds like you're introducing it. You're going out on a limb to introduce something that sounds like it may be a little controversial. So how will you, how will you personally know that this was worth it. This was worth the political capital that in I In addition spent. to these things, personally. What will you see? Yeah. yeah. Um, I hope that people of color will recognize that the council sees, cares about, and is working to address disparate outcomes and discrimination I hope that after facing a lifetime of discrimination, they might feel more empowered to access housing in places where they may not have in the past. Yep, yep. Um, Good. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yes, Commissioner. I would uh, say that um, I would think that if this was, if FAIR worked as intended, mm -hmm. there would be more suits, dis, uh, uh, discrimination suits against landlords who are discriminating against people of color today. So I have a question. Is that the similar to what the mayor said about claims? The mayor thought it would go down, but I think if it works, I mean, That's maybe perfect. we have no, different no, no. measurements, but for me, Good. it would go up because Good. people would feel empowered, mm -hmm. and therefore, if they were rejected, they would want to know why, and if they didn't like the answer they got, cool. they would actually take the next step Good. Uh, to, to make sure that their rights were being protected. And here's the thing. I, I, I did this tricky thing with the mayor's thing. I actually just put percentage. I didn't say up or down. Right, right. And the reason is because whether it goes up or down, what's the question we want to ask? Is, this is it helping? No. Or why? 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 Right. Okay. It's only why. Right. We cannot make assumptions. Right. We don't know why it's going up or down. We actually have to ask the question, why is it going up or down? So we have to find out. It could be a good thing, to the mayor's point, that it's going down because maybe it spiked, to your point, and now it starts to go down because people actually are experiencing better housing. It could be the trust in government goes up, so it spikes. And then it starts to go down because of the quality of housing and opportunity and all that. So again, we want you to imagine that the client is the POC renters. The impact could be one or more of these performance measures. These so are your better off. Yes. I do have a couple more. Yes, then. please. Mm -hmm. Please. The number of people of color in rental housing, and the number of people of color uh, being successful in their in their rental housing and staying there. So the the success the, the retention, retention of people of color. Right. So again, so that's a, that's a percentage of people of color retain who retain their housing, right? Right. And again, I'm concerned that we don't know that. So we wouldn't be able to measure it, but in terms of a qualitative right. report. Right. We said you don't have to have the perfect data. And one thing, is it Commissioner Udaley? Is that to say that right? About the percentage of people of color who feel that the council cares, this is of close proximity to you. So you might see more Portlanders in this chamber saying, thank you, I've been housed. Like that literally, you may not believe it, but that literally could be a performance measure. We go to communities, and where we, where we design these performance measures with communities, one of the biggest ones that largely African-American, low-income community, they said, Theo, prayer is answered. Percent of our prayer is answered. Yeah. And to your point, like, well, we don't have a baseline. Trust me, we didn't have a baseline for prayer is answered. But it's still, it's the performance measure that the community cares about. And even if you don't have a baseline, then you start from zero. We may have some kind of baseline on oh. how many people of color are technically homeless because they're living with friends and families due to barriers to housing. That's right. So that could be measured that way. Good. I also believe it's going to make our community safer because... Uh, it will decrease recidivism. It will help people be successful in their lives. Great. So 
So I, have, I don't mean to cut anybody off, commissioners. Yeah, you guys are fine. so prolific yeah. and wonderful, and I appreciate all of what you're giving. I want to just n now name a couple of next steps that are really hard. Okay. So if you look, the next question is, what's the quality and quantity? And you, like I said, you all know those numbers are pretty easy to come by, so we're not going to practice that. But the fourth one is actually about the data and the root causes. And so this could be just as easily an example. This is about a specific policy, or is it legislative? Is that, it's a, mm -hmm. oh, it's a policy? Okay, mm -hmm. good. So it's, this is about a specific thing, but it could just as easily have said percentage of staff of color who, uh, you know, a strategy to retain staff of color. It could just as easily have been a strategy to make sure that the budgeting process includes more voices of community CBOs from the nonprofits, uh, whatever it is. Um, so let's pick one and guesstimate, don't freak out, Commissioner Fritz, please, don't, don't kill us, red, yellow, or green about how it is right now for people of color. Red, yellow, or green. So when I say red, it means it's not good. Red. Yellow means, okay. Green is, it's great. And if it's green, then we actually have no problem, so we don't need to worry about that. No, we actually agree Okay. That we have a problem, it's okay. a red problem. So which, so which of the metrics do we want to say has a red? Currently? Uh, which one? Yeah, currently. We have racially diverse neighborhoods. Red. Yeah, red. Red, okay. All of them are red. I, Maybe. Well, I agree. Okay. POC are arrested for homelessness. Red. Big problem. Red. Okay, red. Okay. Fair housing claims. Red. So, we know um, that? Well, I mean, we know that fair yes, housing. Yes, we do know that. Yeah. We okay. do know that. 25% yes. of. Okay, yeah. POC feel that council cares. Now, this is for all of you, because this is actually red. not just about this. This is red. 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 Yeah, except for a couple. You, you, all can, you all can have difference of opinion about that. I think it's red. Okay, so we have two yeah. reds. Not sure? No, I, I would say it's yellow. It's yellow, and then um, Mayor? Not sure? Not sure. Okay, so we have an orange. <laughs> <laughs> a dark orange. And sometimes when people don't know, the, the, you all remember how hard this was. When I said to you, you don't know, then I'm going to give you a red. Because red just either means we don't have the data or it's a problem. It's also a problem if we don't have the data. So we just give ourselves a red or a zero well, until it, we get the data. And again, it depends on who you're asking. Because right. if you ask white people how people of yeah. color are doing, they'll tell you they're doing just fine. That's, that's right. That's right. So that's why it's POC feel that council cares, not yeah. white people think council cares about POC. But if you ask Latino Network that's or right. NAIA or something. And you may break it down. You may say you may have differences in terms of community who've been served differently, okay? So you might want to not just say, uh, we don't like to just say POC, but the, for the purposes of expediency, right. we do. But not, not in general, we don't do that. Okay, how about POC Red. feel empowered, okay? POC are retained in their rental housing currently. I don't know. Don't know? Yeah. Not sure. Not sure, okay, red. But that's an unsure red. And then percentage of communities that are safe. Let's break it down by communities. Um, I, I don't think that's expressed quite right. I guess just like. Is that an index? I'm anticipating a decrease in crime, which okay. I described as Good. a safer community. OK, so currently crime, is it crazy here? Like is no, it lots of crime? I'm going to say you it's know, a I'm, yellow. OK. I yeah. would say a Christmas. safe community is a community where you know your neighbors. Right, okay. which has absolutely nothing to do with police or okay. um, so we'll do both crime rates, then. right? If you know your neighbors, then Good. that's a community that's cohesive, that has cohesion, Good. right? So we have those two different metrics. So we might just, we, you get the point. Yeah. Now, next step, everybody. Now you can see it in parenthesis, overall root causes. So let's just pick one, okay? And you all, you all remember this process, but actually now the commission, the, excuse me, the council and the mayor are a little bit ahead of you all, so don't be sad. You're going <laughs> to do it for all day tomorrow and all day the it next day. Never happens, day. right? Yeah. <laughs> so let's pick one. Um, and since it's your project, I'm going to ask if we can, um, somebody else picks one, but then, then you contribute again. So something that at least most of you can, can say, why is it the way it is currently? Which one do we want to pick? Um, Commissioner Fritz. Mayor. Come on, guys. I can't, I can't pick one. You can pick one. Right. Yeah. Racially diverse neighborhoods. Racially diverse neighborhoods. Okay. And what about you? Which one would you pick? Hey, that works for me. Yeah. Okay. So now, you're like, but Erica, you just made us pick colors and blah, blah. We don't have the data. No, no, no. It's okay. We don't need the precise data to know it's red. So, yeah. do we want to talk about a specific neighborhood? Or do we want to talk about neighborhoods in general? Well, we could makes sense to talk about North Northeast Portland, which has gone from Northeast majority uh -huh. uh, black to minority black in 25 years. Okay. 
And so currently it's a red in Northeast Portland. Is it racially diverse there right now? Not well, even close. What I it? would say relative to <laughs> other neighborhoods in Portland, it is ra racially diverse except for East Portland, but it there has been a mass displacement. So I think the number's around 25%. 25% what? Displacement? Uh, no, sorry, people of color. USA? Okay. And was it, so what was it, so let's do a trend line. So it used to be, well, when, when people of color were forced to live there, it was like 65% African American. And when was that? Around when? And that was right after Vanport, so it Post -World was. Post-World War II. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it was 65% then. And, and, what, and what, what was it in about 1990? If you so just guess. 1990, 10,000 African American homeowners. Yep were pushed out of Northeast Portland. Okay. Um, and let me just say that was after uh, the uh, I-5 expansion, after Emanuel Hospital's expansion. Every public works project Memorial displaced African-American homeowners and business owners. So was there a steep decrease in 1990? So in 1990, there were 10,000 homeowners that were African-American who were displaced from inner Northeast. Out of how many? Do you have a sense of it? Out of... No, I, I don't I, know the exact number. But it, was it, went, no, it was huge. So 19, kind of something like that happened. 1990 like, was oh. the beginning of just this okay. mass slow decimation displacement. So let's yeah. say we don't know exactly what happened, but it was a steep crash. It was. And a, then we, let then me we just say it was a are. steep crash, and we did not call it a housing emergency then. Nope. Okay. And so now, and where might it go if we don't do anything? So here we are at 2019. What happens in 2025 if we don't do anything different? Well, but we have done a few nope. things to keep I, it from I know, getting worse. I know, but. Commissioner. I, 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 but if we so did much nothing love to you. You're being so kind. If we did nothing different. If we did nothing different, I would suspect that there would be less than a 1% African American population. Can keep going Because now that we've pushed them out to the edges of East Portland, the next move will be out of the city of Portland. Got it. Got it, Commissioner. So for everybody else, it's a steep decline. If you see this dotted line, all that means is if we don't do anything. And the commissioner's like, well, we are doing something. I'm like, totally got you. No, no, I mean, we have done previous stuff. things in oh. the last couple years. And it's, and it's slowed, it, it has, has it, do you know if it has changed? It has slowed down rent increases. It has eliminated no cause evictions. So it slowed so it down. It slowed but it didn't go it down. up. No. Okay. So, okay, I just want to make sure that I'm not putting yeah. bad data down. So it yeah. slowed down, but it still is getting worse. Yeah. Okay, good. So now we have our data trend. And we're going to do the quickest root cause analysis. Oh, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> so why is it that currently you have black folks being pushed out of East Portland? Why? Huh. Yeah. Well, what? Northeast. You, OK. And this is for the council. These yes. are the big dogs here, so I just want to be honest about what we're talking about. We started with POC. Right. Someone went black. Right. This is something you Somewhere all need to wrestle with. We okay? it's the most and there are some cities yeah. where in their results statement, right. they will be explicit right. about what we call the canary in the coal mine. Right. And you have great power to allow your bureau directors to be specific. POC has been clever across the country because it aggregates our Asian brothers and sisters. It's very complicated. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. So just and We're note, you've done it here. So Erica wants to go root cause. She's going black. That's yeah. not what everyone said. That's something that would be okay very helpful that? to these people if you wrestled with and landed on. And it's not to the exclusion of others. Right. There's tons of research that says if you go there, it will help everybody. Everybody. Okay? So there I just want to I just want to pause yeah. at that Thank point you. because yeah. it, it is it is an important Good. strategic decision for your bureau directors to be clear about where the strategic focus is. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Theo. So we have this red, right? Red. So now why? And I know, Commissioner, you said a lot about the history already. So we have some of those root causes. The history. What happened in 1950? What was the specific thing that happened? Well, there's a lot of um, urban well, development. The, the flood. Oh, flood. yeah. OK, good. That was what else? So why 40s. else is our black people being? So that's one of the reasons why there are 10, ten minutes? Yep. Well, why there are black, but I'm not asking about that. I'm asking why currently are black people being pushed out of East Portland? Rising I'm rents. What was it? Well, political okay. representation. Yeah. What was it? Rising rents is the okay, good. number one Keep reason going. now. But rents and, and one, one more. Property speculation. Speculation, property. Lower incomes. And lower income. Good. Property speculation and lower income. Okay. So we have flood, which is in the past. We have political representation. We have rent. 
we got to take flood out because oh, yeah, flood is what right. brought people that's to the community. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. that, that actually is probably down here a little in the root a little bit. We'll it talk is. about that in a yeah. minute. Property speculation and income. Oh, I love your clarity. I really do love your clarity that you can see the how you get to root. That makes a lot of sense to me because a lot of times people um, can't correct me, and you're completely right, which I love. It's I'm like a stickler favorite. for details. I love it. Well, oh my okay, god. What do we have? Okay, let's pick one. So where are we gonna go? No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. It's very. It's, it's a lot of. I get great gratification. Which are we gonna pick at? Property speculation. Rent are high, political representation, or income. Let's actually not, I'm not going to go to income for right now. Let's do one of the other This ones. is hard because we're, we're leaving out the fact that we, through racist public policy, policy. basically engineered this crisis. That's fine. So policies, they exist right now. That, okay. That you're going to undo. So we put policy. So, you, so you, you, you really have to put urban development on that list. You well, that's, okay. part of that's under policy. That's under policy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and so red line. So do we want to pick policy, or is there another one we want to pick? I don't know why we have. Why do we have political representation on there? Oh. What did you say? Why, why do we have political re representation? I don't know. Mr. Why? Because I, I added that. I guess that's one. We don't I, have to. I think have, that is yeah. absolutely one reason why black folks keep getting pushed because they don't have political representation. I mean, I would pick policy just because okay. we and planned and, you know, our we way. Have, we can have them all. Yeah. The whole thing about root cause analysis is that we can actually have a conversation. We would about each one. Your, your, your departments are going to actually have a conversation about all of them. I'm curious. And this happens, and I love it. It's the dynamic no, that's very I, and healthy. I'm curious. Do you think that that's not a cause of Ooh, let's pick it. I'm going to pick it now. <laughs> yeah. Ready? I agree. So why does political representation de connect to the displacement? So I love the heat. Why does it connect to the displacement of more and more black people from East Portland? So you put there. So let's start with you. Why? Well, because if uh, we were the decision makers, if we were the ones with power, we certainly wouldn't be displacing ourselves from a community that we've made home, so, right? So and I, so the people that made the decisions about, gee, it's a great idea to give Emmanuel this plot of land uh, and give them seven years to develop and it. never take it back 32 years later and then call it a partnership with the community to undo, uh, to so, undo racist practices of the past. So, so that's just one example. Got it. And so why is it that black people are not, there aren't more black people being politically represented in Portland? Why? Well, so there's a few reasons. Why? <laughs> uh, well, I would say traditionally people vote for people just like they hire people, just like they live next to people who they're comfortable with. Good. Why and else? And therefore, uh, it costs um, a boatload of money. And they have less resources that they have okay, less. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. Wait, wait. I'm going to do it. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay we got the mayor and Commissioner Fritz. It costs a lot of money, Commissioner Fritz said. It costs a lot of money to run. She's waiting. She's next. It costs a lot of money to run. Cost prohibitive. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner. I mean, Mayor form of government. It's a structural impediment. No. Okay, no, 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 no. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Guess what? Brainstorm. The cool thing no about root cause judgments. analysis is we can actually talk about all three. We actually yeah. don't need to choose. Okay. Okay? This is the cool part about it. But what is so, wrong? Hold on one second. Okay, hold on you a second. Your turn. So, I have one. And no, 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 wait. I'm okay. just going to, I'm just going to, I know, I know. I, I, I want to do this with you all so for so long. So let's just pick one we're going to dig into. Ready? we got like seven. People I didn't even vote get for to people contribute. like them. It costs a lot to run, or the form of government. Which one are we like digging into? Them. Okay, that's okay. Which one are we going to dig into, though? For now, I'll take form of government. Form of government. For what would you like to vote? <laughs> We're going to. What would you like to dig into? Uh, I would just say, uh, what was the first one? People who vote like for people like. Sorry, sorry I've, I have willingly led you into just. <laughs> The ultimate. <laughs> the conversation no one wants to have. Okay, I guess yeah. we're three three minutes minutes I'm going to take <laughs> we'll we'll fully for now because I'm, I'm going to take them off. These ones are coming off for a minute. So okay. people vote for oh. people like them. Okay, I didn't realize like, that. Now you're taking my choice away. Commissioner, <laughs> in real life, we would truly go through all of these and it would take us like three or four hours. But let's just okay. pick one of them for now. <laughs> people vote for people like them or it costs a lot to run. Which one do we want to go in? Mayor, which one? You're the tiebreaker. Which one can we dig into? Okay, I, I won't pick my own. That would Foster be run or people. Yeah, we'll 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 away. <laughs> Which one? Wait you, do, wait, you took it away? It's, yeah. <laughs> no, it's still there. Later. It's still there, but it's for later. Okay, go for income. <laughs> income. So, so people, it costs a lot to run. So why would black people be disproportionately impacted by the fact that it takes a lot, a, a lot of money to run? Because they are lower income on average. And why? Because of historic in systemic racism. Okay, well, we got, well, remember down here, we got racism. Okay, lack of educational and economic opportunity. Generational economic. wealth re resulting Health. from redlining. Good, 
redlining. Oh, that's together, you said. Redlining. OK, so at this point in our root cause analysis, you can see it gets expanded again, right? We were talking about educational inequity for people of color. We were talking about black folks, economic inequity goes back into our discrimination, all the stuff we talked about, but other things. Um, wealth and redlining specifically in Portland, but also at the federal level as well, right? We would go into those. Now, if we knew, and you're like, well, we can't go back, Erica. We can't go back to 1950. And again, eventually, we could get down to structural and institutional racism, for sure. But now just look at this simple diagram. I don't mean to make it, I don't want to cut anybody off. I just want to say this. What is a root cause that you can just see up here simply, not even going down below here, that you could do something about as council? So costs a lot to run, or people vote for people like them. <laughs> see, I, oh, will, oh, oh, I oh. will fully let you down the road here. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Fritz, what's the campaign winner. financing? Okay, so ding, ding, ding. here's the thing, right? Um, and three of us agree. <laughs> <laughs> this makes it look, I just like, you all just played so well. I really appreciate letting you push on you. The thing is, we would want to do a thorough, to your point, why didn't you let us talk about formal government? Why don't you let us talk about income? We want to talk about those things. We want to understand what's under those things. Some of those things are technical and things that we might be able to change, we might be able to negotiate, other things are really historic and deep. Some of them are cultural and historic. Why do white people continue to want to put white people in positions of power? Why are they more comfortable? Now, we could also do something about that. We could also educate and become culturally whatever. We could put just more people of color in power and screw it if people are comfortable. There's all kinds of things we could do. That's for me. But the thing about your de the departments that are around the table is like if they do this analysis of what's happening in their own organizations, yep. They can actually say, commissioners and mayor, I know we have this great idea, but we did an analysis of what's actually happening. And if we work together, we could actually come up with a solution that would blow this out of the water versus us piecemeal doing it and just kind of missing it and going to that same bench yep. of solutions. Now, this is very macro. And imagine if this root cause analysis was done with a room full of black folk from East Portland who were displaced. That's right. Mm -hmm. Then you'd have some good tiebreakers amongst mm -hmm. you. Because <laughs> right. you all did great, but probably not as great as they would have That's right. But we don't want to make it simplified. It's not simple. When I do this with a, a major foundation, when I, we do this with the city of San Francisco, and we do this, we're, we were just, again, with, we're going to be at Seattle mayor in July a month mm -hmm. and mayor's office. We don't want to make it sound simple, because mm -hmm. you all have complex reasons about why. We want to take our time with it, which is why we've been together for nine months. And that doesn't stop there. The work has to continue. Your departments want this work to continue, because they want to actually make a difference and make, have an impact. I didn't see one person in that room, um, department folks, that was not like totally excited and committed and totally overwhelmed by the prospect of you all not loving this, like wanting them to do this kind of work. Like they, they want this, they want the authorization, they want to do this work, but they know that it might not look as good at the beginning because sometimes they're gonna uncover some stuff that's sure. just. So um, just to leave you with, there are more steps. The next step is like, okay, if you were serious about changing form of government or poo people, people like pe white people like white people, sorry for the shorthand, um, then who would you have to partner with? Because the mayor, and the commissioners, like you all have such authority, but there are so much rich resources in the community that you need to partner with to get this stuff done. And so the next question after partners is, what could you do? And then what will you do? Mm. So it is a, all the ideas are good. Community, come with your ideas. Best practice people, come with your ideas. Science nerd, at, you know, academics, come with your ideas. Now we have them all there. Which idea, which idea or, or more address the root cause? Again, it's a match, it's a rigor, and then we propose to do this thing, mm -hmm. okay? And then we start again in that thing, now we do the same process again. Who's the client? How do we know they're better off? And it's this iterative process that just, to your point, you don't know where you're gonna end. So that's what we say um, is the power of this work. We are, we are racial equity advocates that work inside of systems because often nobody works inside the system. They just wanna work with who, the folks that live in community and that's critical work. But we wanna make sure that inside of systems, we really, that people are really able to use something so rigorous to deal with racial equity. So you've done it. Snap for yourself, we snap. Can we snap the for snap our, for the uh, commissioners our, and the our mayor? Here. Well done, you've done a crash course in RBA. What I will say, one of the things that the mayor mentioned which sounds like the elephant in the room, form of government, <laughs> is something that has come up a lot. 
from your bureau chiefs. And so the, 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 the volatile nature of your we terms and transition. We have outstanding leadership here. Exactly. <laughs> so, so if there's any way for you all, what we would typically do at the end of an RBA training is we would, we would ask you for some reflection, and we do have five or so minutes for you all to give us any questions or thoughts you have. We would ask for a reflection, and we would ask you to make an action commitment. And this is really, this functions, I don't want to call it a dysfunctional system, but it, it plays out for them. So that racial equity changes every few years, or this or that. And so I, I would just challenge, respectfully, the commission and the mayor to think of a way to empower these folks on a multi-year basis to actually do this work beyond your incredible leadership in light of some of that some of the nature here. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for the time. We really, really appreciate thank you indulging us. Yeah. Thank you for allowing us to do that. We'll, we'll sit back if there's anything you want to ask or offer. Well, and if I could just speak to that last point, the intent is to continue coming back to the whole council with binding city policies that empower right. the directors and bring them together so that the racial equity work lasts long after any of us are no longer on the council. And, and the key is if, you, if they can co-define impact, then they can figure out what their slice of the pie is. And then if you shift, right? I know the council can say you can be um, commissioner over a certain set of bureaus at one point, and that might shift. The impact doesn't change. The thing that they're right. aiming towards doesn't change. Uh, that sounds like if it's aligned with your vision, then that's extraordinary. And my concern is that that goes on whether there's a city manager or a city commissioner over a particular bureau mm -hmm. that um, either way, we need to have those impacts and those clear, that, that clear path. And I would just say, I, I just can't believe you like circled that one. But let me just say <laughs> that um, I, I, I don't think that, I think that once you unpack that and got to the root, yes. you would find out that it is not in fact the form of government. It is how we operate within the form of government that Love we it. have. Love it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, you know, it's like I, I, I think that's a default position that yeah. people take because, you know, it's a great excuse to like not do things differently. Right. But right. nothing in our current design right. actually doesn't allow us to do things differently. So I, 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 I've politely disagreed with the mayor over and over again on his premise about whether it's the form of government or it's how we operate and maneuver within this frame. Well, I mean, but to be fair, the cost to run is directly linked to form of government. That, that was my thinking in supporting that item because we are at large. Our district is the whole city. Sure. And although there are no, no longer any districts that are majority minority population, I do think that if we had districts, it would be easier for African Americans and people of color to run and win if they had smaller ground to cut. And, you know, I mean, I'm an anomaly here. Commissioner Hardesty is a bit of an anomaly. Hopefully, it's the start of a. Got it. And, and might I just um, offer that when we name something at that point, it is in the root cause analysis where some of that stuff comes out. Mm -hmm. Where are the areas at which we can make some changes? And where are the things that we feel like we can't make changes in? So it's not a matter of saying we, we're circling it because it is the core. Mm. We're circling it because it keeps coming up and it keeps yeah. it's a story, it's it's a it's a real story that it keeps being told and being told. So if if part of the conversation is not that's the problem and it needs to be changed, but why is it perceived that way? Why is it the way it is? What what is how does it how is right. it structured? Like sort of what's under that conversation as well as the technical aspects. If we did a root cause analysis of that, you would find those nodes of where change and transformation are possible. And sort of sometimes the story of it is part of the problem, mm -hmm. right? Does this part of the analysis look at what, what are the unintended or the yes. intended or unintended consequences as That's well? Right. Yes. It's not just about let's fix that problem, but no. also let's not create a different one. That's right. It does both. So when it's thorough, it actually does both. Um, and sometimes the impacts that we name, like for example, for that fair housing, we are so clear about the things we want for people of color. But we might have some things that we want for, for white folks or things that white, we need to be clear about for white folks. So again, it, there is always the inverse, the unintended consequence, the people who are maintaining the system or having that conversation, and the folks who we are directly desiring to make a difference for. So there's always both sides. And we encourage the departments, as well as everybody else we work with, to, to name the impact 
that we want to see so that we also see the roots of the unintended consequences simultaneously and can address those unintended consequences, not just the sort of proactive component. So it's, it's quite complex. We don't want you to think that we are trying to um, simplify complex systems, and yet by calling it out, we can see that we can do better at, de at, at focusing on roots. And one thing- and, and I'd say that question of is anyone better off would be the question I would leave you with. And we see it, we've seen it often over the last few years and we look at the criminal justice system, folks stop asking, was anyone better off? We were incarcerating folks at great rates. We were doing high numbers really well, people were making money, but then now all across the country, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, people have acknowledged it like, well, who's really better off as a result of that massive explosion of, inca of incarceration for people of color? So it's a classic example of mm -hmm. that negative externality. And people didn't stop to say, well, who's, who's actually better off in the aggregate? Well, Mike Stirr of the Water Bureau has been really enthusiastic about that. He's at a conference in Denver today, otherwise he would be. I noticed I Michael Jordan is here. Yes. Commissioner Fish wished he could have been here. He had a medical appointment. Of course. And I found this, I, I, I've, even though it was kind of frustrating because it's just two hours and it's obviously, as you said, a nine month process, it's really helpful to me to get a flavor of what the work that you're doing. And I really appreciate each of my colleagues for participating and Thank you. sparking Thank you my thinking. Us. Yes, the same. My, my folks have been very complimentary about the work that you're doing. And now that I see it, I can see why they're excited, because you're actually getting to the root causes. It's not just another, uh, 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 what, program or it's, not my, a program. it's something that actually becomes ingrained in the work that's being done. So thank you. Well, in particular, just not focusing on the numbers. You know, when I heard the title, I was like, Right. <laughs> it's, it's pretty it's, dry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we we, we, we want to get it in the door because some people find that, wow, yeah, impact and results. And some people are like, eh. Yeah, but you've made know. it clear that it results are not just the numbers. They may include the numbers. That's right. Um, we've always struggled to quantify community engagement. That's right. Um, and yet it's still a result that we want to figure out how to measure and or, or at least gauge. It's really helped me to think of this approach in similar terms to universal de design. I kind of always go back to disability in my mind because that's my lived experience, but um, we have to design or create policy for the, f for the extremes, and we tend to that's right. shoot for the middle and the extreme over here, which I'm gonna say is affluent, white, able-bodied, well-off people are also very well-served, and anyone who mm -hmm. um, is on the other side of the middle is not has not been very well um, taken care of, and that's why I, a, a subject, not, I hate the word target, but like a focused person, a black woman, a, a low-income black woman, mm -hmm. is going to capture most of what we need to do. I do see disability as that's this right. variable that Absolutely. is a extra challenge that Absolutely. needs to be considered. Absolutely. And I'm always interested in how we work, work that in because, you know, that goes across all That's right. That's right. boundaries. And, and yeah. I guess the biggest fear that I have is that uh, white people will check out. This That's is right. not about me. Why do I care? I'll just go do my thing. That's right. um, and uh, the moment you say we're centering blackness, people check out. OK, see ya. Right? I'll come back when you talk about white folks, right? So how do you make sure that uh, the folks that are, I think that's the question I asked earlier, like, so yeah. what's in it for white folks? That's right. mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a really good question. Well, do you want to answer that or do you want me to answer it? It's true. The first piece is when you do this work in multiracial teams um, and you begin to use um, both members of that team to, to dig into the root causes and you notice that some of the root causes are sort of structural and undeserved, right? Mm -hmm. it, there is this tr transition that happens in the way people are able to understand the work. Um, if you haven't noticed, most of your department staff are white and we have them in the room. And due to some of the work of the Office for, uh, of, of Equity and Human Rights, as well as due to other things that they're doing simultaneously, we can't imagine that just this is sufficient. There is still that hearts and minds work that has to get done, especially for white folks. And so what we say is, in partnership with other things going on in Portland, mm -hmm. 
uh, the way that white folks are becoming, are coming to understand that their humanity is at stake. If, if folks of color are, are struggling and suffering in Portland, white folks suffer too, not just because they personally, you know, don't they're have no a job, here. but they're no, folks of color are no longer here. Mm -hmm. White people will suffer from that. Um, they don't know it necessarily and how it impacts them. Um, but what we also do is develop performance measures for white folks. Mm -hmm. So as we think about the capacity being built, staff of color are retained, let's say. We also want to say white folks, maybe, and this is not something that I am asking you all to do, but I'm just saying, white folks who really are deeply committed to and begin to use our anti-racist lens in their work. And those could be two separate performance measures happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And if white folks aren't moving, then we say why, and we dig, 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 dig. So this methodology allows us to really think about structural and institutional racism from, two, from multiple lenses. And it's not just people of color that are being focused on, but it's also white folks that can be focused on. Um, and we just think that, um, like we said, we don't do the individual level work. We know plenty of brilliant people who do, including people in this room. Um, and that work has to be invested in, as does this kind of work need to be invested in. Um, it's, it's, it's a big, it's a heavy lift for your departments to do this work. And yet they come to the table, they do their homework, and they ask the best questions, which tells us that if Portland is the first place in the country that gets this right, because there is no other place. There is no other place where we're sitting in front of city council except for maybe Seattle soon. So we'll see who... Uh, who makes Which this happen? That? We have seen people use this methodology to successfully transform population level um, indicators. We've seen in Chula Vista, California, third grade reading for Latinx kids um, got up to and then surpassed white children in using this methodology. We've seen foundations completely transform their grant making. We're talking about big boys, like big foundations. Um, create, change their internal infrastructure and then give money out differently and actually start to see impact in community. So it's not, um, I'm not saying that nobody else does it, but not at the city executive level. You all would be the first. Though that, that's usually a collective of people that are like, well, city's not doing it, so we're gonna do it. And then they, tran they, they transform. But you all um, are really at the head of that curve right now. You really are. And maybe Seattle, we'll see. We'll see which one of you. <laughs> not to take New Zealand, national oh, level. Boy. Oh boy, yeah, New Zealand does it as well. We got a healthy competition with Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> First That's time. one thing for you to make white people for care. You. Make them think they're going to win something. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. You can beat Seattle, yes. All right, this Seattle. is deteriorating rapidly. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it very you. much. Thank you, and thanks to all of our department Thank directors. Thank you, department. Thank, Thank you, department. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Oh, we are adjourned. Thank you, Thank Commissioners you. and Mayor. You're here.